Reusing wastewater is a common practice in many parts of the world, as it generates livelihood opportunities, especially in urban settings in low- and middle-income countries. In these settings, urbanization continues at a rapid pace, posing challenges for the sanitation infrastructure with regards to operating and maintaining wastewater and fecal sludge processing. Direct or indirect contact with wastewater is associated with microbial and chemical hazards, which frequently result in adverse health outcomes. Hence, we have to ensure that the health risks along the reuse chain are mitigated. Water streams in these settings are often contaminated with domestic and industrial wastewater. An influx of stormwater can then cause these sanitation systems to collapse. However, these waters, which are rich in nutrients and available all year round, are valuable and can be reused in agriculture, in aquaculture, or for groundwater recharge. Sanitation systems in developed countries are often centralized systems that cover the process from toilet to sewer and finally to an appropriate treatment plant. In low- and middle-income countries, sanitation systems are characterized by aging and overloaded wastewater treatment plants, this coupled with limited fecal sludge collection and treatment from on-site facilities. Open defecation is a common practice. As a result, Water streams generally carry a broad range of fecal and chemical pollutants that can cause ill health, such as diarrheal diseases and intestinal parasitic infections, and can even lead to chronic diseases and cancer. In recognition of the growing use of wastewater, the World Health Organization published guidelines for the safe use of wastewater, excreta, and gray water in 2006 with the aim to minimize public health risks to an acceptable level and to maximize the benefits from wastewater reuse. We will now focus on the risk assessment, management, and monitoring framework of the guidelines for wastewater use in agriculture. The guidelines stratified the exposed population into specific exposure groups with different levels and frequencies of exposure to wastewater. First, consumers of wastewater-fed products namely community members and their children, experience the greatest health risks due to contaminated food, flooding events, and contaminated drinking water or recreational water. Second, workers and farmers experience occupational health risks due to their frequent contact with raw or only partially treated wastewater and accidental ingestion of this water during working procedures. An important feature of the guidelines is that it sets out health-based targets based on a multiple barrier approach. Such an approach can consist of a combination of technical control options, such as safe toilet facilities and treatment plants, and non-technical control options, such as personal protective equipment, education, and risk awareness programs on food processing. In addition, Health systems should also have the capacity to diagnose and manage main health issues. Health-based targets should be set at the national level and could be based on well-defined health metrics, such as disability-adjusted life years, or DALIs, per person per year. Health-based targets can be reached by adhering to verification limits for E. coli and helminth eggs in treated wastewater. Such thresholds can vary greatly for different reuse schemes if, for example, wastewater is reused in restricted or unrestricted agriculture, or if children are likely to be exposed. While the WHO guidelines are a valuable source document, their practicability and uptake in low- and middle-income countries has proved to be difficult. Against this background, WHO initiated the development of a Sanitation Safety Planning, or SSP, manual, with the aim of providing simple, step-by-step -step guidance on how to use and apply these guidelines. The idea for the manual came from the already successfully implemented Water Safety Plan that covers the process of surface and groundwater catchment to its treatment and distribution for safe drinking water. This manual builds on the guidelines for drinking water quality and the limits of ground surface and recreational water. Sanitation safety planning could close the loop between sanitation and water supply while focusing on wastewater contamination, treatment, transportation, use and disposal issues, 
and make use of the WHO guidelines. Hence, the development of the SSP manual included an extensive pre-testing phase in various settings across the world. This visualization will focus on the SSP pre-testing phase as it happened in Kampala, Uganda. Uganda is the world's second largest landlocked country with a population of about 36 million people. The country is situated in the African Great Lakes region, including a large part of Lake Victoria and lying within the Nile Basin. As an SSP testing site, the team specifically focused on Kampala, the capital city of Uganda. 1.8 million live in the city, which is located on the northern shores of Lake Victoria at an altitude of 1,140 meters above sea level. The climate in the city is tropical and it has two rainy seasons, from August to December and again from February to June. Kampala is said to be built on seven hills, although this is not quite accurate anymore as the city has expanded rapidly and urbanization has taken place at a rapid pace. The sanitation safety plan comprises six distinct steps. To initiate the pretest in Kampala, a stakeholder workshop was held to introduce the approach, and a team of experts was prepared for validating SSP steps. Next, a specific SSP training session for technical staff was given, and the sanitation system was described. Along the way, major data gaps on water and soil-related diseases and chemical pollutants were identified, and an in-depth study with health experts was conducted. This in turn helped the SSP team to conduct the health risk assessment and set priorities, and to develop an incremental improvement plan while implementing an operational and verification monitoring framework. Let's now have a look at the steps that were conducted during the testing period. The National Water and Sewage Corporation was identified as a lead institution to select a team of technical experts. Complementary to the SSP technical team, health experts supported the process. The objective was to ensure the safety of the National Water and Sewage Corporation's workers, fecal sludge collectors, the downstream communities, and the environment around the Lake Victoria drinking water catchment. The wastewater chain was divided into four study areas. The Bugalobi Sewage Treatment Works along the Nachavubo Channel, the Nachavubo Wetland, the community areas bordering the wetland and affected by flooding, and Inner Murchison Bay in Lake Victoria. The Nachavubo Channel is 12.3 kilometers long and transports wastewater from communities, markets, industries, and the treated effluent of the Bugalobi Sewage Treatment Works. The Bugalobi Sewage Treatment Works was built in 1940 and subsequently extended during the 1970s. The plant receives raw sewage as well as fecal sludge delivered by vacuum trucks. The treatment plant comprises conventional wastewater treatment processes such as preliminary and primary treatment through screens or grit removers, followed by sedimentation tanks, to biological trickling filters, and finally secondary sedimentation tanks, before being discharged to the Nachivubo Channel on its way to Nachivubo Wetland, where it should undergo a tertiary treatment. The sludge is digested with anaerobic sludge digestion ponds, dried in drying beds, and sold to farmers for horticultural use as organic fertilizer. At the moment, there is a new treatment plant under construction, which should replace the Bugalobi sewage treatment works in the next three to five years. The new plant is also intended to treat 50% of the water from the Nachavubo channel. The Nachavubo wetlands covers approximately 5.3 square kilometers, and has a total catchment area of approximately 40 square kilometers and extensively cultivated with yams and sugarcane. Informal communities that are at the highest risk of flooding are situated along both sides of the wetlands, 
with an approximate population of 12,000 people. Inner Murchison Bay also supplies Kampala with drinking water, which is pumped and treated only four kilometers away from the outlet of the Nachivubo Channel. Moreover, the lake is economically important due to its fisheries. After describing the system, the team looked into the literature and assessed knowledge gaps. For example, they assessed sanitation strategies and master plans for Kampala City and consulted peer-reviewed literature. Data on water and soil-related diseases and on chemical pollutants was severely lacking. Thus, a cross-sectional survey and environmental sampling were carried out in late 2013. For environmental sampling, the team investigated a broad range of microbial and chemical pollutants and heavy metals to better characterize the risk profiles of different exposure groups. Around Murchison Bay, the team looked into reference points six kilometers away, where the Nachavubo Channel discharges into Lake Victoria, four kilometers away, just before the water is pumped into the drinking water treatment plant, and two other points at which the channel discharges into the lake. At five points along the Nachivubo Channel, the team observed pollution and natural treatment as water first comes from the city through the wastewater treatment plant and successively along the channel. At 14 randomly selected points within the Nachivubo wetland, the team recorded contamination levels of the water, soils and plants to estimate the farmer's level of exposure to pollutants. Finally, two points within the community were chosen where children typically play and flooding events frequently occur. This graph shows the levels of E. coli contamination along the wastewater chain. The red line indicates WHO wastewater verification limits for unrestricted irrigation. The E. coli values along the chain were all far above those limits, except at the point just before intake into the drinking water treatment plant. Contamination is only very slightly reduced by the wetland's natural treatment process before the water discharges into Lake Victoria. Of the 200 water samples examined, helminth eggs were detected in 15.5% of them. No Trichurus trichura eggs were found though hookworm eggs were recovered from 13.5% of the samples and Ascaris lumbricoides eggs were found in 2% of samples. Water and soil samples showed that copper, iron and cadmium exceeded the limits set out by national standards. In surrounding plants, yams and sugarcane, cadmium, lead and chromium exceeded the levels established by international guidelines. For the cross-sectional study, the team enrolled 915 participants all over the age of 18. Out of some 120 fecal sludge collectors, 70 were enrolled in this study. 43 wastewater treatment plant workers were enrolled out of the 90 who operate the plant or sewage system. Management and office workers were excluded as they likely had a different level of exposure and socioeconomic standard. The team estimated the number of farmers in the four different zones within the Nachivubo wetland and collected GPS coordinates of the working areas of all participating farmers. Out of 600 farmers, 243 were included in the study. The team focused on villages bordering the Nachivubo wetland. The poor condition of settlements in all communities makes them vulnerable to flooding of the Nachivubo channel or wetland. The research team randomly selected 247 out of approximately 12,000 people in this area. Community residents were exposed to wastewater contamination by eating yams and sugarcane grown in the wetland. Swimming in Lake Victoria and working in the channel were also identified as risk factors. Two additional villages were randomly selected to represent non-exposed communities because of their geographical distance from the Channel Wetland and Lake Victoria. Both villages had similar socioeconomic characteristics and sanitation systems as the exposed communities and were similarly characterized by poor settlements and low water supply, sanitation and hygiene conditions. 
453 participants were selected in both villages. Estimates indicate that approximately 500,000 people live under similar conditions in Kampala. This graph shows intestinal helminth infections for all exposure groups. The highest prevalence was found among farmers, while workers were less infected. There was considerably high prevalence of Schistosoma mansoni over all study groups. With the highest overall infection prevalence of 75.9%, farmers are much more likely to be infected than community members who are not directly exposed to wastewater in the Nachibubo area. To assess and prioritize the exposure risk, researchers conducted a semi-quantitative risk assessment to determine the likelihood, frequency, and impact of encountering one of the hazards along the wastewater chain. Researchers found that children were at very high risk of exposure to microbial hazards. They also found that workers' contact with the sludge drying beds led to a moderate risk of infection with helminth eggs, while farmers working in the Nachivubo swamp were at high risk of exposure to helminth eggs, most likely due to a lack of appropriate protective clothing and equipment. Meanwhile, consumers in these areas were at high risk of ingesting heavy metal containing crops. Subsequently, an incremental improvement plan was developed and implemented to advise on the best actions to take towards reducing risks along the reuse chain. An operation and verification monitoring plan was also developed, which should ensure the functionality of the implemented control measures. Finally, a supporting programs and review plan were developed, together with other stakeholders along the wastewater and fecal sludge chain in Kampala. All processes and results were communicated to stakeholders to create awareness and support for implementing control measures which should ultimately improve the sanitation system and protect public health in the city. This short video describes a health risk assessment along a wastewater management and reuse system in the context of a major East African city. We hope this visualization can serve as a case study for use in SSP training and to support step-by-step -step implementation of the WHO guidelines for the safe use of wastewater, excreta, and grey water in other cities across the developing world.